welcome to the NDTV Dialogues, a conversation of ideas. And who better to discuss ideas with than my guest this evening? He's a scholar, an ex-editor, an ex-minister, and someone who's now on his 27th book just out this week. Mr. Shori, thank you so much for joining me. It's a fascinating book, really, The Lives of Two Extraordinary Saints, uh, Ramakrishna Paramhans and Raman Maharishi. How have, why were you drawn to writing about their lives? Well, uh, they are, of course, among the foremost, uh, some of the greatest um, spiritual figures in our entire history. And there are accounts of them, because after all, uh, Sri Ramakrishna was in the late 19th century. Uh, Raman Maharishi was with us till 1952. So there are accounts of their conversations, the disciples who saw them wrote. Uh, so there's enough literature available mm -hmm. uh, on this matter. And uh, in a previous book of mine called Does He Know a Mother's Heart, I had examined the explanations for suffering. And as I found the ex explanations given in the scriptures to be inadequate, I turned to what these two and Gandhiji said mm -hmm. to persons who had suffered blows of fate when they went for solace to them. And how did they explain their own cancers? Both of them dying very painful deaths of cancer. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I found those also not to be very uh, um, you know, satisfying uh, or reassuring, the explanations, but I was drawn to them as individuals. It's interesting also, because in this book you look at, you said spiritual figures, also uh, deeply religious figures, but you look at them through the prism of neuroscience, science, questioning, scholarship. That's an interesting way to look at the lives of two such revered figures. Did you ever wonder that, uh, is this an area you want to get into? Yes, I think that's a great deficiency in India. Uh, I mean, actually, uh, in, in the West, for instance, the great classic work on this is by one of the greatest uh, founders of philosophy, psychology, everything else, William James. Mm -hmm. It is called The Varieties of Religious Experience. He took the accounts of the mystics as they were known at that time in the West and s said, well, see, th this, is the, this is the real experience. Don't uh, push it away and study it. And, so, and a lot of work has been done on very small aspects, or very uh, minute aspects of uh, the spiritual experience in the West. Mm -hmm. But in India, unfortunately, we don't do that kind of systematic work. And uh, therefore, I was even more drawn to mm -hmm. a field that was open. We don't question. Do you, um, think, do you think that's a lacune? No, actually, we ask a question, but don't pursue it by research or by our own experience. Mm -hmm. We just ask a question and get on to the next story, mm -hmm. um, like journalists <laughs> on TV. <laughs> so we should not be like that. You mentioned should, journalists on TV, not uh, print journalists, sir, uh, yeah. because you, of course, so, are the doyen so, of print journalists. No, no therefore, um, the idea was that we should really go into depth in a matter, and maybe on some matters I've gone I provided more information than was necessary for that particular topic, mm -hmm. but that's because the information itself from a medical point of view for each one of us was very interesting. You brought out as well the, uh, the theory, the whole theory of karma, and, uh, and I mean that's so much an accepted tenet of say Hinduism today, but you use your own personal experience to question um, yes. how karma is uh, conceived or interpreted today. Yes, actually um, that has been much discussed in my, that I did in my previous book. Mm -hmm. And that was that it is just an, um, an, in the Hawaiian Journal of Philosophy, uh, one German writer or something called it a, a convenient fiction. That means that when you can't explain something, you say, it's got karma hoga. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you know it was that? Especially in the case of children, when they've done nothing in this life which merits that, they say, no, must be in the previous life. But how do you know he did something bad in the previous life? Otherwise, he would not suffer like this. So it just becomes a circular argument. Uh -huh. The second problem with the theory of karma is that it always ends up blaming the victim. And I, in that book, I illustrated it with um, Gandhiji's correspondence with the greatest um, Jewish uh, philosophers at that time, in the 1930s, when atrocities started being committed against the Jews by Hitler's regime. Gandhiji comes of very, I mean, we are embarrassed by what he said. He's blaming the Jews. Almost saying that you are not going with a smile on your face uh -huh. um, to face uh -huh. these atrocities. 
So that is not really correct. But, but because he believes that nothing happens except what by God's will, mm -hmm. therefore you have to come to this explanation. So Gandhi Ji, then of course you brought out that that controversial facet, and of course earlier the B.R. Ambedkar book also, where which created such a controversy, where organisations wanted it banned, which is often the sure sign of success of a book. You don't shy away from taking controversial figures or controversial no, actually, aspects, no. or maybe revered figures. Let's put it that way. You don't shy away actually, from uh, looking at them with uh, the blinkers off. But we must always do that. I, and in Dr. Ambedkar's case, I can tell you um, one of the uh, great similarities if I may be so um, uh, immodest as to say, between him and small little people like us is that he actually believed in reading, writing, discussion, discourse, debate. Dialogue. Dialogue, yes. Those people who are now sort of running shops in his name, they don't believe in that. They are not Ambedkarites in that sense. Uh, if you may permit me to say, we are. <laughs> because um, that's what he believed in. And that book, uh, like many other books, came about just by chance. Mm -hmm. um, NTTV's connection. Uh, Srinivasan Jain's father, Mr. L.C. Jain, was mm -hmm. a great, great friend of my father and my friend. And one day we were talking about 1942 uh, and the non-cooperation movement. And he said, but uh, didn't you read what Ambedkar said in the Central Legislative Assembly? I had actually never read anything of Dr. Ambedkar till that time. Mm -hmm. And then I was astonished at what he had said. And then when Gandhi was put in um, uh, uh, in prison, and then uh, he went on a 21-day fast, uh, which almost would have cost his life, mm -hmm. what uh, Dr. Ambedkar said in the Viceroy's Council meeting, because he was a member of the Viceroy's Council of the Cabinet at that mm -hmm. time. Those were surprising things to me. That's how that book came about. <laughs> so it's by chance. No, and interestingly, sir, because uh, in a sense, uh, that was your last book on a political figure. Why is it that somebody like you who has, as an editor, as a journalist, as someone who was an ex-minister, was involved even in a sense with this government when it first came in, why have you stayed away from writing on politics or contemporary no, politics no, that sense, no. our current figures? And, well, uh, firstly, uh, I've not shied away from writing on political issues. I have a book on reservations after uh -huh. that, on fatwas and Muslim personal law and so on. So those were issues of uh, interest to me at that particular time. I've written on national security, a contemporary issue, but uh, on India's China policy, which was the second last mm -hmm. book of mine. Uh, so it's not that. But as far as the current political figures are concerned, I find them to be of, uh, I mean, why not spend time reading about Sri Ramakrishnan Paramans and Ravan Maharishi rather than on these people? Do you think who, who will remember them a few years from now? Where do you see your contribution to public life now? In that sense, there was a certain level of enthusiasm, of involvement, just in the months leading up to Prime Minister Modi being elected. There was a sense that you were coming back into public life. Do you now see yourself completely disassociated? Yeah, more or less, because I also have no, almost no interest. I mean, I read the papers also most perfunctorily, and I have a residual interest in national security affairs. Mm -hmm. But on the rest, I mean, it is actually, you know, by Sonia, one thing, that I am, an, I don't want to keep saying I told you so. It, after all, whatever is happening is in many ways just the um, unfolding of things which people like us have been saying for a long time. And so, what is it? When you look at the, when you look at their lives and perhaps the relevance today of their teachings. What would you say? Because in a sense, when we're talking about issues of religion, when you're talking about spirituality, we are seeing what's being done today in the name of faith and religion and spirituality is in a way completely different from what any of these saints would have dreamt possible. Yes, and that's a wonderful point. Now, you see, it is both by in the public, by politicians, and by the so-called godmen and saints of today. These characters are running real estate empires. They are riding around in motorcycles, in gaudy clothes. Do you mean uh, Baba Ramdev? No, many of them. Uh, uh, yes, pharmaceutical empires also. So what have they got to do with Raman Maharishi and Ramakrishna Paramahats? Therefore, I would really presume uh, that the, um, these fellows must be held to the very high standards set 
by Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa and Ravan Maharishi because these characters are traders in our religious tradition. Mm -hmm. They are not of that tradition. They are just marketing people. But so, mm -hmm. that is one point. Second, I th that's about these uh, so-called uh, godmen of today. But the second point is of religion in the public space. You see, the essence of uh, all Indic religions has been an inner directed search. And uh, Ram Maharishi and uh, Ramakrishna Paramahans embodied that essence. Mm -hmm. For 12 years, you can't imagine the austerities to, through which uh, Sri Raman Maharishi put his own mind and body till he felt he, he felt that he was, he had gone mad. Sim the same thing with uh, Sri uh, Raman uh, Maharishi. Now, but today all manifestations of religion are external. You are wearing green must be because you have an Islamic heart, some such bloody nonsense. So there is nothing uh, in India, so long as we stick to the essence of the Indian religions, which is the inner directed search, we are one. And the moment we get on to externals, we are at each other's throat. And that will put such a strain on the scaffolding of the Indian state that I really tell you, I fear that that strain will be unbearable for India. Mm -hmm. That is one point. Second point is that, that as the discoveries which these people made, the Buddha made, Sri Chaitanya made, uh, Nagarjuna made, in, during the course of that inner directed search are the pearl of great price which India has found and preserved for the world. If we focus on that, if we translate even a bit of that in our lives, we will really have a contribution to make to the world. If we go on to the externals, we will just be killing each other, you know, in the name of a cow today and a pig tomorrow. What is the point? It's interesting you said that of religion in the public sphere because uh, many had said at the appointment of Yogi Dityanath as Uttar Pradesh chief minister, we crossed a certain threshold or a certain conscious step was done by the BJP. Perhaps the implicit uh, belief that India is a Hindu Rashtra, as the RSS Mohan Bhagwat has said many times. What do you think that actually symbolized? And do you think when you talk of religion in the public sphere, does uh, the appointment of Yogi Dityanath perhaps represent? a step which hasn't really been taken before. Some compare Uma Bharti, but of course she wasn't the head of a mutt when she had taken over. She was a practicing politician. Uh, I, I would hesitate to talk about these things, but still uh, I feel actually the, the explanation may be somewhat different. It may not have been the BJP's choice, but uh, this, uh, Yogi Adityanath forced the choice. Mm -hmm. It may have been that. Because thus far the pattern in uh, Mr. Modi's regime has been to pick persons who do not have a base. Mr. Fadnavis, Mr. Khattar, my very dear and good friend Sonawal, uh, Mr. Uh, the Gujarat person Rupani, mm -hmm. they don't have a base. And similarly, his own central ministers. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, the appointment of um, Yo um, Yogi Adityanath may have therefore not been according to their, the wishes of these two. Maybe they selected somebody else, but by that time, Adityanath may have mobilized the MLAs in such a way that they, um, for the first time, stood, stood up to the central leadership. 